So we are here this uh, this evening with uh, with Bill Norton, and for those who are familiar with the internet and peering, you know, Bill is probably a very well known entity in the peering world. You know, a, a regular at Nanogs and, and a distinguished uh, sort of presence at Nanogs and IETFs and such. And uh, now, of course, uh, having done a long career at Equinix, uh, Bill has started off with the Dr. Peering website and his work uh, as a peering expert. So, uh, Bill, please, could you take a couple minutes just to tell us, you know, what is going on in Dr. Peering and a little bit about your background before we jump into talking about internet exchanges and data centers today? Absolutely. Um, I finished up my uh, MBA at the Michigan Business School in 1998 and received a phone call from a, a gentleman I'd known for years named Jay Adelson who said that he was um, launching a new exchange point and uh, he wanted to build them internationally and asked me if I could be on his advisory board. I said, you know, I've been studying entrepreneurship for the last five years, <laughs> and I would love to help you launch this thing. So I took on the title of co-founder and spent 90% of my time over the 10 years I was there working with the customer base. My um, self-assigned job was to understand what peering is, understand how it works, the process of peering. I wanted to understand why the customers wanted to use these facilities, or if they didn't want to use these facilities, why not? What were the stumbling points and obstacles and the pain points? And I documented everything that I learned in the form of peering white papers. And I sent these peering white papers out to anyone who wanted them. I was invited to speak at conferences on these white papers. And at those conferences, I got to talk with more people about, you know, processes of peering or peering ratios or what have you. And by assimilating the community's mindset on a particular topic, I came up with white papers that I could share with folks and represented the community mindset. Yeah, and I think topics. that, uh, just to add to that, I mean, those white papers represent a collective body of knowledge that I believe is not found anywhere else uh, in yeah. quite the same format or it's, it has not been distilled in the same manner, which is where, you know, I became familiar with your work, Bill, and I was, this is about 10 years, maybe eight years back, started to read some of the white papers on peering. I was interested in that subject because of looking at network planning and capacity mm -hmm. and so on. And then as I was telling you, you know, I've taught that to some of the students that I've had the privilege of teaching at, uh, at IIT Bombay and so on. And uh, even late, as late as just a couple of years back, still looking at the same work and trying to understand, okay, what are the evolving best practices? You know, sure. Which brings us to the present day. And uh, of course, now of course I understand, you know, you had a Dr. Peering website and uh, you're offering your expertise to uh, to a variety of different operators in different parts of the world? Yeah, um, my, my first motivation after I retired from Equinix was to make sure that all the research that the community had shared with me remained freely available. So I, I found a, a sponsor with the DKIX, uh, the um, uh, exchange point in, um, in Frankfurt, Germany. Mm -hmm. um, they sponsored me to collect all that information, assimilate it, and put it in the form of web pages so it remained freely available for the Fantastic. community. Fantastic. And I was very um, happy to find out that as a result of that website, I, I started receiving consulting engagements. So yes. I would fly out to South Africa or to Kenya or to uh, parts of Europe and put on two-day peering workshops walking through that material. And it seemed to really help folks. I really, I, I love the fact that the material that I was able to collect um, and put out had this ripple effect where people around the world now use this information and I, I've never met them, but yeah, it's, it's we, benefited. We it's just great. had, we had we, in fact, we were just talking with Bob Bender of CTS Telecom and he was, you know, he was really very pleased with, uh, with what he learned from, uh, from your material and how valuable it was in their interactions with <laughs> That, with that all the made my day. <laughs> I, I love when that happens. Okay, wonderful. So, Bill, today, uh, you know, why we're here is we have this series called Conversation with Experts. Sure. And in particular, we're very interested in understanding, you know, picking people's uh, sort of expert brains and understanding a little bit with you today about sort of data centers and, and peering. So let me just start out with, uh, maybe you could give us a bit of insight into the classification of the data center models in the field and how that's evolved over, over, over a period of time. Sure. Um, I spent some time in the field talking with a variety of folks that, that build data centers, and I asked them, you know, if we were to classify these things, how might we put together a model to differentiate the different types of data centers? And what I learned is that the core of every data center is real estate. And what you really want to have in, in certain types of data centers is to have your data center located at the fiber nexus points, where all these fiber providers have very close access 
um, to the networks to bring into the data centers. Um, surrounding that real estate, you start building in rings of value. So surrounding the real estate, you apply uh, reliable power. And here you have your, uh, your generators, your UPS systems, your, your, your batteries or what have you. And now you have real estate that's fundamentally more valuable because it's, it has reliable power. If the grid goes down, the utilities go down, this, data, this real estate has reliable power and will continue to operate. Now around that more valuable uh, real estate that has reliable power, you put in place uh, conditioning, air conditioning units, HVAC, heating, venting, air conditioning mm -hmm. units. And now you have conditioned space with reliable power, and that inherently is more valuable than just plain vanilla real estate. Got it. Around that you build uh, security. Now if you're going to have multiple tenants within this building, you need a more complicated system sure. for security. This would have things like security guards and maybe escorts to escort the different people into their cages. Um, you have to have a mechanism so when people are fired from their company, they can no longer get access Don't into the shared curious. facility to get access to that equipment. So all those types of systems. The, um, you know, in uh, the UK, they have uh, moats <laughs> around some of the data centers. Data centers. And right. guard booths and, you know, uh, barbed wire fences and all kinds of stuff like that, bulletproof glass. Around some of the facilities, you'll see Kevlar around the perimeter of the building oh. to prevent people from going around and, and, and shooting through it. And um, all that kind of stuff I put into the security ring. So once you have that in place, now you have reliable power with conditioned air and a security system. So the, um, the infrastructure that's put in that building is now protected. That is inherently more valuable than just the plain real estate. Absolutely. Now around this, you build the different models with carriers because without having a network, you have an island. You need to have mm -hmm. some way of getting capacity into that data center. Um, in a carrier neutral model, you'll tend to have multiple carriers coming into that building to sure. service that. If it's a carrier-owned facility, you'll generally only have one provider. So the ring is uh, kind of, a, I don't know, a, a single contiguous ring where the only, only one provider comes in, where a carrier neutral facility, you'll have kind of different um, pieces supporting multiple carriers coming in. So that's where the fiber nexus is valuable, the starting point of the data center. Exactly, exactly. Okay. And if you have that carrier neutral facility, you have substantially greater value in that real estate because now someone coming in like an ISP, the next ring, can choose which carrier it wants to purchase from. Indeed. And some of these ISPs have special contracts and deals uh, with certain carriers. So if their carrier of choice is in that building, then that becomes a very attractive data center for them. And you have ISP-owned data centers, so again, you might have that shown as a ring with only one ISP in the building, or you have carrier and ISP neutral facilities. So multiple ISPs can come in and interconnect with each other and buy from different carriers. And then the last part of the data center taxonomy is the content provider ring. Uh -huh. And this is where you have the uh, content provider or content providers, plural typically, being able to buy from multiple ISPs in that building who have um, diverse access across different uh, carriers. So this whole thing is kind of a way to think about data centers and um, the business models really drive what the customer base looks like and how the interactions happen. So, I mean, would you say that over the last maybe I don't know five to five to seven years, mm -hmm. this what you just described has become the standard de facto way uh, people are thinking about when they start think about installing a new data center? Then these are the factors they they have to take into account. Is the, is the real estate there? Is the fiber uh, convergence happening? And do you have enough content providers and ISPs that uh, will find that location attractive? Where you're going to you know from a pop, pop up perspective or from the point of view of uh, exchanging traffic. Yeah. Uh, so that you can build the data center out there. Yeah, what you tend to see in data centers, um, I tend to think of it as a, a pyramid. At the very bottom of the pyramid, you have the carriers who bring in their capacity. Sure. These guys are coming in because they want to sell transport to the ISPs. The, second mm -hmm. ca the carriers are there to sell transport to the ISPs that are in the building. The ISPs are in that building because they want to peer with each other or they want to sell transit to the content providers, the third group of folks. Indeed. So when I ask the, the peering folks, how do you choose 
which exchange point to build into, the things I was describing with respect to those rings come into play. Uh -huh. They ask questions like, well, who is in the building? How many carriers are in the building? Is Quest in the building? Because they're the, the one that I prefer, for example. Mm -hmm. um, what ISPs are in the building? Because those are the guys I want to peer with. Those are the types of things that are used to determine which exchange points are, um, are selected. That is a good segue into, into the next one, which is, you know, they, I, I understand that there's some differences between sort of the U.S. and the European exchange points. Right. And, uh, you know, that's something that we were talking about uh, prior to coming on, online. And so yeah. uh, is that something that you can share with us and give some insight on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I found it fascinating that the European model for exchange points is a bit different than the U.S. version of exchange points. Hmm. Uh, when Equinix was first launched and I gave a talk at the Wright meeting in Amsterdam, I was describing the carrier neutral model for exchange points. And um, one of the co-location providers said, yeah, but the exchange point model you're describing is not neutral. <laughs> and I said, what are you talking about? It's not run by a carrier. It's not run by an ISP. And they said, well, here in Europe, we are ISP and carrier and co-location neutral. Wow. So this is how it works in Europe. They have a separation between the co-location providers, the guys who run the data center, those inner layers, and the folks who operate the peering fabric. That's a wow. different company in Europe. This is how the links initially started, and now the rest of Europe has copied this model. So the links, the London Internet Exchange, will build a POP, a, a switching fabric, inside of a co-location provider's mm -hmm. um, uh, data center. And they will be the ones who are attracting the ISPs and encouraging the ISPs to interact. These exchange point operators, the switch, the switch operators, are the ones who are uh, formal associations. These are not-for-profit associations of the ISPs themselves. Different from the U.S. In the U.S., you generally see the people who own and operate the data center also own and operate the switch Absolutely. and also try and pull the ISPs together to pair with each other and also try and get the content providers to come in and buy transit. In the U.S., they try and manage the entire ecosystem Absolutely. and operate everything. While in Europe, they, they separate out the operation of the data center and the co-location stuff from the... Uh, pulling together and facilitation and appearing so among the population. It's almost like it's three different functions in Europe, with whether, whether it's all handled by the same provider typically in the U.S. I mean, it could That's be, right. So uh, an Equinix or a Terramark will do the whole turnkey thing. That's exactly But in Europe, right. so it's really three different sets of folks that are doing that. Well, well, here's the beauty of the European model. Uh, once the co-location provider um, fills up and they run out of space, the Lynx model, the European model, would put out a request for tender asking for mm -hmm. an additional co-location provider to come forward and offer up their services. Ah. In the early days, the co-location provider would be bidding and saying, look, I'll give you free space, Lynx, in my data center if you put it there because having that switch there will draw customers into the co-location space. Absolutely. And in this way, you might have in, in the European model a co-location provider for the first location and a different co-location provider for the second and maybe even a third and fourth and fifth and sixth. This way the ISP can select which of these exchange points a uh, co-location provider facility they want to go into. Mm -hmm. Maybe one of them has better security or has the systems that they prefer or maybe it's a better location for them. They have carrier, uh, they have carrier ISP and uh, co-location neutrality. They wow. can choose what facility to go to. In the U.S., if you are in, in an Equinix facility, um, you can peer with anyone in that Equinix facility, Absolutely. and they will sometimes expand into another campus. I see. Uh, but it'll still be an Equinix, Equinix facility. Campus, right. It'll only be an Equinix facility. That's just the way that it's done in the U.S. So, uh, Bill, I mean, just off the top of your head, I mean, do you see any obvious sort of advantages or disadvantages, or do you think it's just the way regulatory things happen, to, you know, that's just the way the, 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 the chips fell, and so the evolution proceeded like that? I'll tell you a couple of things that I find very interesting. Um, in Europe, the prices for co-location services and peering services have always been a bit less than in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Now, you might ask, why is that the case? And the reason is that the associations that run these switches 
are not for profit formal associations. I they're see. not supposed to make money. If they make too much profit, they lose their not for, for profit status. They uh, have to pay taxes then, and they, they're a corporation and all that. Um, and uh, as a result, they have a motivation to continue to drop the prices of peering ports. Okay, so that's one difference. Uh, so the prices tend to be a little bit lower in okay. Europe than they do in, in the U.S. Okay. On the other hand, in, uh, in the U.S., there's great flexibility on pricing. Uh, a customer comes into the U.S. Uh, facility and says, I'm not going to come in unless the prices are X. In the U.S., the model is, well, let's see if we can make that work. How valuable is this particular ISP Indeed. to the population? How, how will they draw other people into this building? And you might find folks getting a really sweetheart deal if they are very attractive peers. So if well, you're a content they, provider you know, that everybody wants to pair with, that would be valuable, clearly? Um, that might be an example. Another example would be access networks. Access networks are very, <laughs> very powerful draws for facilities. So Indeed. they might get a great sweetheart deal. In Europe, however, uh, since the association that runs a switch is um, owned by the members that participate, they generally will have the exact same price for everybody. After all, you own the, the association. Absolutely. You don't want to give a better deal to your competitors. <laughs> That's right. Right? That's right. Everyone pays the exact same price. So there's not the kind of flexibility in pricing that helps build that population in the early stages. And the other thing I was thinking about is in Europe you might have, I mean in, in, in the U.S. It's, it's one turnkey price. I mean you're paying one, one provider off that entire ecosystem, right? Right. Whereas in Europe if there's, even if they're non-profit associations, you're paying uh, to the peering guy, you're paying to the colo guy or, or the data center guy and right. so on. So you're actually paying a different bill. Right, and I don't know if cumulatively all that is still cheaper than paying to a one-stop shop like we have here in the U.S. It, it's a little cheaper in Europe, generally speaking. Again, that not-for-profit side and the association takes, takes care of that. Um, yeah, just to give you some some round numbers, at a time when the 10 gig ports were maybe seven thousand dollars per month, mm -hmm. you'd find the prices in Europe. $2,500 per month. Wow, that's a significant difference. It's not a small difference. I see. Um, now there's also another difference that's, that's a little bit more subtle. In the U.S., you have um, customers. In Europe, you have members. Uh-huh. Right. And there's a, uh, a different dynamic. You have members that can vote uh, and decide who is going to be um, you know, overseeing, who's on the board of directors of this exchange point. They, they kind of own that operation, oh, as see. opposed to the customer relationships where, you know, if, if you're uh, really pissed off and, and, and you want to leave... You can always do that. Yeah. It's, it's just a subtle difference between customers and members. And, and that has continued to be the case, I mean, even to the present day, that's pretty much how the, the two, are, you know, two sort of continents work in terms of how they set up data centers. Consistently, um, points. across Europe, They've all adopted the Lynx model, the, the European model. Uh, we're starting to see a couple exchange points in the U.S. adopting the European model where you have co-location neutrality. Mm -hmm. uh, we just heard today about the, the Torix, where the Torix is now adopting that, that formal not-for-profit membership association, based membership based model, um, co-location neutrality and all that kind of stuff. Um, but across the rest of the U.S., yeah, it's, it's the commercial model, the exchange point is run by the co-location provider and that's a, a commercial venture. That's very, very interesting. And then segueing from here, you know, one of the things that obviously comes to mind is uh, the value of the internet exchange. You know, right. You obviously done a lot of work on that, Bill. So what, what, uh, what in your mind are sort of the keys, highlights of, of having such an internet exchange? Maybe you could tell us a bit about that. Yeah, um, again, this is a really interesting topic to me because the question on the table is very often, um, how valuable is this exchange point to the community? Mm -hmm. And uh, after doing some, some scratching of my head and talking with a number of exchange point operators, um, we, we came up with this formula. Um, since the value of the exchange point to the peering population is proportional to how much traffic they can exchange with each other for free, then you can compare that against the next best alternative, which is paying transit fees for that same traffic. You bet. So the math would work out like this. You take the amount of traffic that's peered across a shared peering fabric at exchange point, and you multiply that times the price of transit, which might be a couple bucks a meg. 
So if you have an um, uh, exchange point that has, let's say, um, 100 gigabits per second of traffic, and the going price for, for transit is, is two bucks a meg, you have an exchange point that is saving the peering population two bucks a meg times to, uh, times 100 gigabit per second. Mm -hmm. um, and now that is the value of the exchange point to the peering population because the alternative is to send that traffic through a, a transit provider. That is, of course, an assumption. There, there are other paths for that traffic besides sending it to a transit provider. But under that assumption that the next best alternative is going through the transit provider, you can calculate approximately the financial value. Now, if you subtract from that the fees that the ISP is paying, to participate in that uh, facility, then you get the net benefit that the population is paying. So separate out the fees that they're, they're paying from the um, I'm kind of screen this. No, from the uh, from the total that you just described. Yeah. Right. Then you have the the net value. The net value der yeah. derived. And if you divide that by the number of participants, then you th that's the value for each participant. Exactly. Yeah. And as long as that's above zero, you have a valuable exchange, and you can go to somebody and not persuade but prove financially that this exchange point is worth participating in because you spend a thousand dollars a month but you're getting two thousand dollars a month worth of value. Of value. I see. So who, I mean, is, the, I mean uh, is this something that has been known for a while or like who really came up with this kind of a model for quantifying the value of the internet exchange? It's kind of been a collection of a whole bunch of folks having these conversations over I lunches see. and dinners and beers. And, and is it formalized anywhere? Uh, I mean, I, you know, in, in some of your writings, or is it totally yeah. formalized? Or? On, the, on the website, and um, I have a book coming out that's an assimilation of a lot of this intelligence collected from the field. Okay. And um, in the chapter on the data center taxonomies, um, we, we actually go into the, the math and apply that to several of the largest exchange points around the world. So you can actually prove financially it, it will probably make sense to go in to this exchange point based upon the amount of traffic you peer. Actually, I'm glad you brought the book up. So I was going to say my, my question to you was going to be, I heard you're, you're writing a book on all, the, all of the uh, you know, expertise that has been accumulated over the years. So obviously that's the case. Yeah. And I hear it's going to come out imminently in, in, in the next few months. Yeah. So uh, what is the status of that? Uh, maybe you want to share some of the details. Sure, sure. I, I'm, I'm really excited about this. The, the, the book is called The Internet Pairing Playbook, Connecting to the New Core of the Internet. And the idea is to walk folks through the definition of transit, the way that transit is metered, the way that you would uh, deploy transit, some of the, the tricks of the trade that the peering folks shared with me for manipulating uh, transit. Sure. And um, the combination of introducing the definitions with the applications and the playbook, I found through these peering workshops that I run, really help harden the, um, uh, the understanding among the students. Absolutely. And then we go into peering, we talk about the, the, uh, the process of peering, the motivations of peering, and um, we go into the business case for peering, proving financially if it makes sense to peer or when it doesn't make sense to peer. And we go into a little bit then of the, uh, the ecosystem, the evolution of the internet peering ecosystem from being the NSFNet uh, kind of a planned economy, centralized core of the internet to the commercial model of national service providers and uh, network exchange points um, and then evolving, growing organically into this massive what I call a global internet peering ecosystem, you bet. where each country has its own little internet peering ecosystem of tier one ISPs, of content providers, of tier two ISPs, and they all look strikingly similar. And if you look at it through the, the model that I've created, you can actually predict the behavior awesome. of all these different companies. They, they, they were pretty close to being exactly the same. So they follow a certain trajectory that, ha that you've been able to map out? Exactly, and it's all based upon the context that they're placed within. Okay, and then uh, I guess one of the important things is the book's coming out. I mean, who do you think uh, it would be very valuable for? I mean, clearly I can see value for all of the emerging economies, all yeah. of the operators there who are kind of learning about peering or uh, exactly making the decisions that you're talking about, but now yep. they have a basis. Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, the collective learnings can be used to do that. Sure. Um, the, I think the book is primarily for the tier two ISPs that are um, getting enough traffic that they think maybe building into the core of the internet makes sense. Maybe they can save enough money, maybe it's strategic for them to have enough um, uh, proximity to the other providers to get their traffic offloaded more quickly, sure. improve the performance. 
Um, I, I think this is a very valuable book for the, the CDN operators, for the executive teams of these emerging services. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned um, um, other parts of the world, um, folks in, in places like Africa and in, in Eastern Europe, um, a lot of different com uh, countries that are just going through that exponential growth Absolutely. as the price of transport goes down and internet services become more integral to the uh, society. Um, these are the folks that are starting to build exchange points, they're starting to build a critical mass, and uh, they can take advantage of the knowledge that's been collected from really around the world that I put into this absolutely, book. Absolutely, absolutely. And that actually is a quick point to, to that. You, you know, you, what, what, one of the most important things in an in, in exchange point is to build that critical mass. Right. And um, what, what have you learned in, in your sort of uh, analyses of doing this? for so long now as to what is it needed to get that critical mass. Yeah. And you alluded to some of the characteristics, but yeah. really, how do you get there? Um, there's a whole chapter in, in the book on this topic. So the, the issue is when you build a data center and put it um, in place, you start out, and everyone goes through this, you start out having no customers. You have a very expensive building, and the, the buildings Equinix built were on the order of $100 million to build. Sure. You have an empty building, though. How do you get that first customer in the building? Indeed. Um, it's a really tough problem. The, um, um, in the book, I call this the startup hump. The, the issue is <clears throat> to go into a co-location facility where no one else is there, you need to have a, a motivation to go in. Um, you start out with a concept cell. You say, you know, this is going to be a really huge facility. There are going to be so many people in here. You really need to, Mr. Carrier, bring in enormous capacity because you won't be able to keep up with the business. Business, once it gets there, yes. It, it doesn't often fly that they'll say, oh, okay, I'll spend a million dollars and come and populate this building <laughs> with nobody in it. So um, I, I asked exchange point operators and co-location providers, what do you do? How do you guys solve this problem? And um, what you recognize very quickly is that the value of the exchange point follows this exponential growth. Uh -huh. It starts out being below zero. There is a, a negative value of participation if you're the first player. Wow. Because there's nobody else there. Sure. You spend the money and you, there's no one else to interconnect with. So it's effectively, you, whatever you spend to get in, you lose. Until, so, until more people come along. The second person comes in. Now there are two parties for you to interact with and there's some value derived. Indeed. Um, is there enough value to cover the cost of building in is the question. Well, you get that third, that fourth, and that fifth person into the building, and now all of a sudden there are five people that can interact with four other people. Indeed. You have N parties that can interact with N minus one other parties. That's where the exponential value comes. Now, uh, I guess it would depend on the size of the data center as to what that number N is, at which point things start to turn uh, profitable, and mm -hmm. of course for the operator, but also for, as you, said, as you described earlier, in terms of what is the value derived for each of the participants, right? Right, and right. I, I presume that varies based on the how big of a data center one has and how many players you need to make that all work out? Um, actually, the, the size of the data center determines how high up uh -huh. that exponential growth can go because once you fill up that facility, then you're done. The, the value can't go any higher. Sure. You have sure. filled it with 1,000 people, 1,000 people interact with 990 other ones, and... That's and it. There, there's no more that can really happen if you fully saturate that, that building. Sure. But the, the real question, I think, is at what point is the value derived from participation exceeding the cost of building it? Indeed. Because Indeed. Once, you ex once the value derived exceeds the cost, then, you're then you have that exponential growth. Right. Then all of a sudden, like I said, you can prove financially it makes sense to so build into that exchange there. point. Yeah. 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 That is the new... Uh, past critical mass exchange point, and, and that's where everybody wants to be in the co-location. So in, in, the, in the book or any elsewhere in the, in the literature, are there any analyses or examples which maybe talk about some example uh, data centers or even some hypothetical cases which do this number crunching to say, well, if you had X amount of capacity and here's a data center that was being built, mm -hmm. here's the numbers of people you need for exactly this positive effect to, to come into play. Yeah. You know, I'm describing that exponential uh, curve there. Uh, part of the challenge is, you know, you can say, well, the value of the exchange point, you can calculate that value as being proportional to how much traffic is peered away for free, mm -hmm. and you multiply that times the price of transit. By the price of transit, right? yeah. Um, but 
folks brought up, you know, is that really the, the right label for the access? Is the value of the exchange point really proportional to the amount of traffic period? Or maybe is there a component of that value that's proportional to who else is in the building? I was just going to say The desirability yes, of those routes. Yes, absolutely. And some folks would say, you know, I can pick up that traffic elsewhere. What I really want to get me to build into that exchange point is somebody who I don't already peer with to be in that facility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I can pick up the easy to get route somewhere else and I can go into your building to get these other routes that I can't get anywhere More else. More desirable routes, yeah. Um, so it's maybe a combination of, of the two of them to really evaluate. Um, if you really wanted to put a monetary value on it, then one would have to work with both these components. Um, uh, perhaps. So perhaps the value is not just the volume, but uh, the uniqueness of the routes that you can pick up. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, that's great, Bill. So it's been wonderful talking to you, and thank you for the insights that you've shared. Sure. And, you know, as, we, as uh, you've already said, the book is on the way out, so we are hoping we can get more, uh, you know, all of your collected wisdom there, and then hopefully as more learning happens, there'll be more white papers we are looking forward to from Dr. Peering. Sure. And, uh, and to sh your sharing of the knowledge, which, of course, has been the very bedrock of what you've been doing this past decade for all of us here. I'm glad to help. Thanks for inviting me. Okay, well, thank you so much. Take care.